Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monica Lissi. I'm the CEO of Martel Innovate, and I'm also the director of the NGI Outreach Office. Um, this is, a, um, this is a, a webinar, a workshop that we um, promoted within the context of the NGI because we strongly believe that uh, without greening uh, technologies, the digital transformation that we are so much promoting uh, will not help us grow our society and economy in the direction we need uh, to preserve our planet. Uh, the good news is that there are uh, many innovators, many researchers, a number of organizations in the public and private sector that are more and more investing on greener technologies and on the use of technologies to green the world. Today, for me, it's a pleasure to have on board uh, several of those innovators and policymakers that are at work dedicating the energy and their efforts um, for a next generation uh, internet that is uh, safer, that is more secure, but that it's most of all more sustainable. Um, I won't take much of uh, our time because I would like uh, this session to be quite interactive. Um, there are, of course, uh, there's a Slido. I will try to keep an eye on Slido, but we also have the chat of the Zoom uh, connection. So please uh, feel free to express your questions, input and comments while we are uh, going throughout uh, the discussions. And, uh, we want this to be as much interactive as possible. It's not a one-to-many sort of uh, webinar. I have uh, with me on board excellent speakers. I, I have uh, Loretta Nania, that is uh, one of our uh, senior project officers at the European Commission in DigiConnect, in particular in the Next Generation Internet Unit, that I would like to thank very much for joining us. We have Adrian Perig, and I never know uh, if I should say from EP, ETH uh, or um, from Anampaya, but actually he's wearing multiple hats. And today it's here as an NGI innovator that will tell us more about Scion as one key technology uh, for um, uh, routing traffic uh, across the internet into a greener uh, way. Uh, then we have... Um, uh, Chris uh, Adams. Uh, Chris is uh, representing a, a growing community um, of uh, um, innovators, researchers that are at, at work for an open green web. Uh, welcome today, Chris. And finally, we have Dr. Giovanni Rimassa, that is uh, the Vice President of the Digital for Planet Association and is also one of the NGI ambassadors, having been involved in several NGI projects. That will, that will tell us more about what uh, the NGI, associ the nonprofit association, is doing for a more sustainable internet. So uh, it's my pleasure to see that people are joining, the community is growing. This will happen now. The floor um, goes to Loretta. Loretta, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So, hello, everyone. So, the question we are here to look at is um, how to deliver on the twin transition. It's a really big question. Uh, I've been 30 years in the Commission and uh, I've seen a lot of digital plans for resilience and recovery. I've also participated in the Sustainable Development Goals with the UN. Um, but to put these two together is something fundamentally new and very challenging. And I think the Commission is ahead on that. In fact, the whole EU can be ahead. Now, Personally, I've really suffered. Uh, this has been the year of uh, degrowth and a year of reset for myself. Um, I've had to lower my expectations and, and make a lot of, a lot of uh, end of year declarations. I'm not willing to give up coffee, gelato, ger uh, Belgian chocolate, but am I willing to give up the internet? Now, what shocked me is the, one of my projects work, which you can see in this slide. It's not my slide. It comes from uh, Louis Stapel Harris at Nesta. And this was a deliverable that I didn't even ask for. It just, as I said, when I saw the title, Internet of Waste, I thought it was an insult. I didn't know. And then when I read it, I started really learning that internet gobbles quite a lot of energy. I love the internet, I love foreign travel. I know Greta Thunberg says that you shouldn't take planes, uh, but I'm not 
I don't think Loretta is going to tell you not to take the internet. Although the internet of waste is growing unsustainably. So even this year of reset, internet use has gone up 20%. Um, internet, mainly, it, it, there, there's culprits. I'm going to name the culprits. So the big culprit uh, is uh, the dirty dozen, uh, is the, the blockchain. The, the, the Bitcoin, for example. So Bitcoin, uh, it leads because it uh, produces 37 million tons of CO2 emissions annually. Now streaming video, and when I saw how, how much of the environment is consumed by pornography watching, I couldn't believe it. But um, okay, uh, streaming video as we are doing today, uh, is quite a culprit. In fact, uh, if one hour video streaming produces anything from, and by the way, all of these figures will give you interval because there are different ways of calculating. As I said, it's quite complicated. So one hour of uh, video streaming, as we are doing in this session, we're consuming anything from 150 grams to 1,000 grams of CO2 anything from two to 12 liters of water and a piece of land, the use of this, my screen. Okay, that about that size. Now, if we switched off our nice faces here, we would at a stroke reduce that internet waste by 96%. But would you want to not to see my face or all the panelists? So I think uh, the year of twin transition and reset is going to be a difficult one. And um, as, as was said in the previous session by Adrian, uh, we really need to be more aware and more engaged in, in our choices on the internet. So because time is short, I will not go through the internet of waste uh, report, nor the, the circular economy aspects, which uh, you can read for yourself. But I'm gonna have a little game, a little exam if you want, I would like all of you to put up, not to be ashamed, to put up your smartphone, if you own one, in front of your screen, okay? If you don't own one, you get a medal already. Um, now, could I please have the next slide and then you'll see how you do in terms of grade. Okay, so this comes from the Greenpeace report. So I get a B minus. I don't know if anybody does better, you get a B, but you can go down that list. What's important is to see the three categories, energy, resources, and chemicals, okay? So as I said, a lot of the effort in some of the groups that you'll hear from the next speakers are really important in getting a, a, a reasonable measure because the one I gave you in intervals changes by about 10 times. Well, for example, let me give you that Europe is a very, you know, uh, we have 27 member states. Uh, practices are very different in the north and the south. So 27% uh, of the waste is created by the production of these little things. And these little things are growing 27%. That's completely unsustainable. Um, I used to have a, one of these um, Nokia, one of the first Nokia, the one that if you walk into an airport, they think you might be a terrorist. It's so old. Uh, and my son would get the very first, the latest uh, iPhone. But I think it will go next to the recommendations. Well, one of the big recommendations will be to maintain the resilience of our devices. And the EC is working on that. And the NGI unit has had, well, at least three meetings so far on the internet of waste with POs from from consumer protection, from DG Environment. So uh, we have started a process, which uh, Monique and, and uh, this project are continuing, which is to increase the engagement, the awareness, so that everybody's little gesture will amount to a radical, as I said, reset, okay? So next slide for me, the next one, please. 
Yeah, this I've covered, this one. We will go quickly. So these are the recommendations. And as you see, we have four, uh, four aspects, okay? I'm just gonna go quickly. So conflict minerals, the use of rare minerals already since this study was, uh, was printed last year, already we've seen sort of Calgary in Alberta, we've seen a number, we've seen uh, the price go up, we've seen Congo, we have seen countries aware. Uh, of course, we have to have stricter rules because uh, not everything is licit and not everything is declared. But if you look at these recommendations, um, they're all over, okay? There's not one recommendation. So I just want to go into uh, what I mentioned about the easiest, the, what's called the low hanging fruit for all of us, uh, which is to look at our use. I mean, I, I really changed my use since I discovered uh, these things. So I'm really, I've changed my use of the internet. And by the way, I've been on the internet since 1980 at MIT. I was on, uh, on, on, well, I was on the Maltics system called DARPA. So I'm really the old generation, but I think it's really important for the, the next generation internet to really present a completely different future for that generation. Um, so a couple of words, so which have to do with the internet. So how do you maintain the resilience of devices? So of course the commission has a proposal to make sure that updates are provided. And if the company does not want to provide them, some open source company can take that over and continue because of course cyber, cyber security is one of the reasons why you might want to have these updates, okay? So there is an important uh, quid pro quo in, in holding on to your devices. But I get a feeling, and I really enjoyed the previous uh, uh, workshop on the architecture, uh, I really get a feeling that you need to see the internet as a whole, right? This was one of the end-to-end the -end permissionless innovation. And the idea of, of being aware of, of the internet as a global monster, but a good monster, okay? Good monster. And we are living at one step ahead of a major crisis because so the maintenance let me take uh, android android phone has, phone has 12 million lines of code facebook has about 20 million uh, windows 10 has about 50 million and that's just the platform okay so we are operating with this uh, threat of cyber just like one step ahead of a big vulnerability of uh, of the of the connected society so this was just an introduction, and I just want to say how much I've learned from these engaged meetings of different people from, dip, from sociology, engineering. And so I think it's a good thing to start. Thank, Thank you, you, Loretta. You have touched uh, very important points in a very dense presentation and in a few uh, minutes very difficult to cover it all, but you uh, gave us a, a pretty good sense of what are the main key areas and priorities for the community to address. And now we enter into more technical technology aspects with Adrian Perig, uh, that is professor at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology of Zurich. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll share my screen. All right, very good. So we have been working over the last uh, 12 years on the SAN next generation internet architecture. And um, it was originally designed for high security and also high efficiency communication to replace BGP or provide an alternative to, to BGP uh, used in today's internet. And so recently we've noticed also that SAN can offer several aspects also for green routing and um, improved um, carbon footprints on the internet. So, but briefly, so SIGN offers highly available communication for everyone. And the belief is that communication is really a basic human right that should be, able, that should be available to anyone. So SIGN is already a reality. Um, we have been having um, real world use cases and actually production use for the last four years um, or since uh, August, 2017. And it's been a 
quite a large effort. It's been growing since the beginning. And today we have seven ISPs offering native sign connectivity, as well as a global network of over 100 data centers that have uh, native sign connectivity. And just to make sure we all are on the same page, this is not an overlay network. This is not dependent on today's internet. This is really truly native um, sign connectivity between all these, uh, all these entities. So coming back to, to energy. Uh, so sign offers three, three levels of energy reduction and I'll walk you uh, one by one through these. The first level is that, and this is, was a bit of a surprise to us, that a global sign network actually has lower power consumption for communication than today's internet. Uh, it's quite surprising because sign offers um, secure communication and has cryptographic primitives on routers, but there are a number of points that uh, reduce the power usage and I won't go into the details, but if we could replace today's internet with a sign internet, we'd save on the order of a gigawatt, which is not that much, right? At the global scale, this is uh, really quite little. But um, I think the main point here is that despite the high security, there's actually less uh, power utilization. Now, the next point is that because sign offers uh, different paths to get to the destination, one can make use of these paths um, to, or one can use this path diversity to optimize the carbon footprint. So here's an example communication from Zurich to London. And you have um, on the, you can have different um, metrics for which you optimize. So for instance, optimizing for CO2 um, on the one, on the diagram on the left, you see a path producing less uh, CO2 through France one perhaps producing a bit more CO2 through Germany um, and, and the Netherlands. But in case of um, this, if the sun is shining, there's a lot of solar energy produced in Germany, wind energy in the Netherlands, that this may actually be in the end, the greener path. Um, and you can also have uh, certificates that are attached to path information so that you can also trust what you see uh, when you uh, use one path over another. And you may want to prefer paths that have uh, certificates that you can actually trust the, the statements made. Now, how much does this really um, uh, affect in practice? So here we looked at a few examples. So in the first one from Geneva to, to Moscow, the typical BGP path we've observed at this moment actually goes via Stockholm and then back to Frankfurt and Moscow because Poland is using a lot of um, coal-based um, power, the CO2 was actually quite high. Now, it turns out there is a much shorter path, of course, a more direct path. And you've already, you're already saving quite a bit on that, but we're also able to reduce the exposure of not going through uh, Poland or using less uh, uh, coal-based electricity. And so, here we computed that this particular green path gives us, or the path shown in green is also green path and gives us, um, or requires only uh, 13, uh, 130 milligrams of, of CO2 per gigabyte of communication. And this was a relative reduction of 93%. And so it turns out that in Scion, you can actually reduce the carbon footprint of your communication. Um, another example here, between uh, Frankfurt and London with two different paths. It turns out the one th through Geneva, now in this example here, um, reduces uh, the amount of CO2 only um, to about, about 40 milligrams per gigabyte, 77% reduction. And so the point is that if you're a ISP or autonomous system that has a lower carbon footprint, you will attract traffic to you you can actually also increase revenue. And this is always very important to make sure that um, economically, uh, there, there are economic incentives to also become greener. Now, the third level, uh, having this level one and two, the third level is quite exciting because if you look at what happens, if you have such um, green routing, uh, you and users can actually start selecting these green routes. You have 
the advantage that the green ISPs attract additional traffic and therefore they can increase their, their profit. So then in order to attract even more traffic um, or maybe they will lose traffic because they're not that green yet, they can improve their energy efficiency and use more green, uh, green electricity and thus become more attractive. And this in turn, more available, uh, higher availability of uh, green routing paths will also um, lower the latency and uh, attract even more users and so on. And so this forms a virtuous cycle, which then results uh, based on our simulations in many ISPs actually switching to greener energy. And even if a very small number of users initially start routing in this way. So we find this is quite exciting and um, we can, we... Um, Thank you Fine. very much, Adrian. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we can come back to a couple of points. Um, I would have a couple of questions, but let's now give the floor to Chris Adams. Chris, I'll let you introduce yourself and the Green Web Foundation. Please go ahead. Okay, two seconds. All right, folks. Hello there. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about making the web green. Um, as uh, um, as Monique mentioned, yeah, hello, my name is Chris. I'm one of the directors of the Green Web Foundation for the last 11 years. We've been tracking uh, the transition of the internet away from fossil fuels to green energy. And my details are here if you want to get in touch in more detail. Um, it's useful before I start to talk a little bit about the internet and about some of the figures around it. Because if we think about basically the emissions that come from the internet, it's easy to get kind of caught up and feel like the sky is falling and it's uh, and get almost somewhat alarmist, right? Generally, like of when we look at all the kind of things that I guess our society is built on, the internet has been one thing that's actually been pretty useful over the last 10 years. And for the emissions it creates, it's actually been a pretty good deal in my view. Like we've seen figures for figures like um, 36 grams of CO2 for an hour of streaming, which make you might think, oh, that's kind of bad, right? But then if you, if, you th if you compare that to say, the carbon footprint of just having an espresso in the first place, that's like 10 hours of streaming, right? Like an, a, a, an espresso is around 300 grams of CO2 for each one of these. So when you talk about it, it's just to get some kind of sense of perspective for this. Now, over the last 10 years, we've seen uh, the internet provide a huge amount of value. And uh, what we've actually seen is we've had things like Moore's law basically mean that while we've increased our use of the internet, it's largely stayed about level. And this has actually been uh, quite useful, but it's also important to remember that we don't need the internet to stay level. We need the carbon emissions from the internet to get down to zero if we want to meet net zero uh, standards or get, 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 get to net zero by 2050. Also the thing I'll share with you is that for the last 10 years, we've been able to lean on things like Moore's law where the cost of computing and the efficiency of computing has increased without us having to do too much ourselves. But increasingly, uh, it's now going to be relying, it's gonna be down to like developers and technologists to actually build with this in mind and take a much more active role in this, which is what I'm gonna be touching on a little bit here. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the idea about this this key thing about that it's really important to kind of remember, right? The reason the internet has such a carbon, such a large carbon footprint is largely because it's coming from burning fossil fuels, either from the creation of electronics or the running or, or, or the generating the energy that everything ends up running on, right? And it's easy to not talk about this and talk about, say, just efficiency all the time. Now, I'm going to keep talking about this because we really, really need to get off fossil fuels and. Uh, if we're not talking about ways to incentivize not doing that, like we saw with Adrian, then we're in many cases, we may be missing some of the points here. So if you've decided, oh, OK, I build digital services or I run digital services or I use digital services and I need to get them off fossil fuels, how do you do this? Now, it's useful to think in terms of a service as one being comprised of like a stack of different providers and suppliers who will, who will make something available to you. So Netflix might rely on, say, Amazon, for example, and a number of other providers and so on, right? And uh, what we do at the Green Web Foundation is we basically make it easier for people to green their stack by providing a directory of uh, green hosting companies and green providers of these digital services. And uh, this is what we tend to uh, focus on. 
and what, what I want to talk to you about, because green power is something that we tend not to understand quite so well. And uh, in many ways, it goes beyond just actually having to use a green energy tariff, especially if you look at the entire system. So generally, when you are getting power from the grid, even if you're paying for a green tariff, you're actually getting a mix of, say, fossil fuel power and, say, green power. And uh, some of your money might go towards uh, making sure that's a green to, uh, to helping increase the amount of fossil fuels on the grid. But in some cases, it doesn't always do that. And some cases, some providers will maybe just pay for things like, say, carbon offsets and things. What we really, really need to do is find a way to understand how much of the grid is running on fossil fuels and get rid of that part. Because as you can see, around 80% of the carbon footprint of the internet is actually coming from the use of it, right? And uh, when I talk about uh, green power, it's quite often to talk about uh, green power being something that happens at a kind of annual basis. Uh, so you might say, well, I'm running on, I'm on a green energy tariff now or something like that, and that's green for the year. And that's how we've actually been working for the last, say, 10 years or so. But increasingly, we are shifting our perspective to much more focus on a higher resolution than yearly uh, balancing of kind of green power, right? So if you are, if we, if we look at, say, where power is coming from and how we source power, it's useful to bear in mind that a annual figure for something like this is actually doesn't show you the whole picture. You could be saying that you might be running, uh, running on 30% green power. Uh, for example, all of this is coming from wind. What's really happening is that you, you've actually got power, which is, it's actually, it's, it's a, it fluctuates a lot more than this. And if you want to group, move to an entirely green internet, you need to account for this and design for this. And uh, you can look to some of the work that Google is doing as an example of this. So Google have released a report called 24 seven carbon free power, where they have been talking about this. And even a com organization, a trillion dollar a multinational company, they have set a target of 2030 to run all of their infrastructure on green power at an hourly basis, not just an annual basis. And they uh, talk about power like this, like over a year, they might have a steady amount of power like on this kind of black line that you can see here. But because renewable power is currently quite intermittent, as it, it tends not to work so well at night or when it's not so windy, you need to find other ways of providing that power to kind of meet these black troughs. And uh, there are ways of doing that increasingly, like say uh, by using battery storage, which is, which is 10 times cheaper than it was at the beginning of uh, 10 years ago, for example, just like wind, just like solar, for example. There are ways you can move towards this. But we do really need incentives to make this possible. And this is the stuff that we try to shift towards and are increasingly working to make this more visible. So when people work with us to try and green their stack or find providers, we can provide this information on a more hourly basis. And uh, this is some of the underlying stuff that you saw with Adrian Perig's work with Scion. So this is the key thing I'd like to kind of uh, leave you to leave with. If we want to have a green internet, we need incentives, both at a commercial, but also a kind of policy level to move to hourly green power and transparency around that so you can see that. And this is one thing I'm really interested in speaking to about other people as well, because this is one of the key ideas that underpins some of the really cool stuff you saw with Scion. And I think that's me. Um, if you're interested, you can look us up here. Um, I'm on Twitter as Mr. Chris Adams, and I'm also part of an online community called climateaction.tech, which is full of around four and a half thousand uh, technologists who are looking for ways to green their stack and come up with a response uh, in respo uh, a response proportional to the climate crisis facing us. Thanks everyone, I'll hand back to Monique now. Cheers. Thanks Chris, thank you very much. I think the stack uh, should be able to climb up uh, the minds of all of us in the sense that we are ultimately responsible for the choices we make at several levels and I think uh, growing awareness, as Loretta mentioned before, it's one of the major uh, steps also towards a more, um, let's say, conscious uh, data consumption and also digital behavior. And uh, uh, some of these uh, aspects have been also uh, pushed forward to the community uh, via Digital Free Planet. And uh, now it's uh, my pleasure to give the floor to Giovanni Rimassa, Dr. Giovanni Rimassa. Please, Giovanni, the floor is yours. Yep, thank you very much, Monique. And uh, let's start directly 
with who we are at Digital for Planet. I am Giovanni Rimassa, Vice President of this nonprofit organization named Digital for Planet, and we are based in Switzerland, and uh, we are constituted to support the development and adoption of green digital technologies. And uh, as was mentioned already uh, in the, pre the initial presentation by Loretta, uh, this thing that uh, the digital transformation is important and the green, uh, let's say, sustainable plan is important is not new, but the fact that we need to do them together and they don't always see eye to eye is a relatively more recent, let's say, realization. So, uh, without going to, into detail here, uh, it is clear to us uh, that uh, the IT, the communications, and the general digitalization of uh, very aspect, various aspects of society and economy, they belong to the solution set, they can do a lot, but they also be belong to the problem set. And there is no way to act on a single variable and to decide to have uh, larger data centers or uh, faster networks or uh, less, uh, let's say, longer living devices. Each of these things can help or not in combination and independence of all other factors. So we are really facing, uh, let's say, um, systemic, uh, systemic challenge. So uh, as uh, was mentioned before, I had the honor and pleasure to be NJ ambassador. So here I would like to, let's say, give a nod to some output that has been uh, created by the NGI Forward project. There will be also a workshop tomorrow that will, uh, will uh, also continue on, this, on these topics uh, and it will be interactive. So please uh, consider joining because you can also get engaged into the discussion of this, uh, these very themes. So in their report for the vision of 2030, they follow the classical uh, network, uh, computing network idea of having the network uh, divided in various layers from the physical infrastructure all the way to applications, but they also added the societal impact. So not just let's stop at the application as uh, software and hardware that does stuff, but also let's consider the consequences of how people behave and how society um, evolves. Mm -hmm. Some different uh, key concepts were, were identified there, like resilient network, sustainable, and so on. But uh, what is important is that uh, it was recognized that any of these important concepts, do we want to make the internet more sustainable or more resilient or more democratic, all these things, they affect all the pillars, okay? Or sorry, all the layers. So it is a network uh, stack problem, and not only that you can solve it at one layer. So, in Digital for Planet, uh, we started to, to, I mean, to, to discuss about this. And uh, uh, while we fundamentally agree with this, uh, with this uh, view that was, was synthesizing the vision by NGI Forward, and that you can see on the right part of the slide, so these are the four let's say, objectives for, for 2030. And you can see there is an economical aspect for circular economy and also to check the life cycle, uh, the life cycle cost of devices and uh, um, address the, the energy use of a data center economy that we just heard about from Chris. However, given now putting on the hat of the, of the nonprofit, let's say networking oriented association that the, the, the uh, interest in having people come together and discuss this topic, there is also a narrative aspect in all of this because um, that uh, trains uh, or uh, airplanes can have an environmental impact. Nobody doubts about that. But uh, IT and software have always thrived in the last decades by advertising themselves as immaterial, right? So we have uh, very old uh, slogans like Microsoft's information at your fingertips uh, that always push the idea that software and the IT is uh, floating in ethereal space and doesn't really have impact. Whereas we know it has a lot of impact, certainly energy consumption, but also device life cycle, uh, uh, acquisition of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, raw materials to, to provide these devices and also has behavioral implication. Because this fact that the software is immaterial and so it's cheap to upgrade, I can now upgrade most of the, the software that I use for free because the cost is somehow hidden in a way that I don't see, of course, uh, fosters this, uh, let's say, hyper consumeristic, fast recycling, sorry, fast upgrade uh, culture that uh, has its own, its own set of problems. So at the moment, uh, as Digital for Planet, we think that this is such an important point of how we apply the general digital and sustainable, let's say twin uh, transformation for the next generation internet that we created a working group on that. And uh, the, let's say the idea of the working group is to try to 
support the development of a future internet that is human-centric, open, and sustainable. Now, again, without going too much into details, also because the audience of the NJ Forum is extremely familiar with this, it is, um, you can see the, say, the historical traces in the NGI program of the fact that the realization that internet uh, social aspects were at stake, like the internet could become undemocratic, could become unfree, could become uh, unopen, they predate the idea that the internet also can become unsustainable. So let's say the NGI program so far has been a little bit more biased towards social, economical and, and online fairness and democracy aspects and less on, let's say, purely ecological environmental aspects. So that's why one of the, the goals of our working group is to foster the synergy between the two, these two aspects that I conventionally uh, label human-centric is more about society, behavior of people, and what it means, what the online um, tools uh, uh, affect on the society. And sustainable here is meant more in the environmental sense of carbon footprint and uh, uh, environmental impact. Then we want to also uh, open a discussion by adding this layer of the social impact as, as uh, NJ4 vision was, was, was pointing out to include the so-called else uh, topics, so ethical, uh, legal, environmental, and, and social in the future uh, internet stack. And we want to uh, foster discussion on, on, these, on these aspects. So concretely, and especially from a European perspective, we have heard already, and uh, we, we, uh, you can also check on the Digital for Planet website. We had webinars on this on these topics as well, where you can hear also other uh, experts and uh, European Commission representatives providing different uh, different angles. Uh, Europe now is full on on the joint, uh, the twin transformation, digital and and uh, and environmental. And what we can do, of course, is on the one hand to engage and participate in the research and innovation multiple research and innovation opportunities that, that are here in Europe present. And we have to also um, consider in a, let's say, in a more holistic way, the balance between advantages and, and risks that using this, this technology and developing the internet can, can bring, especially considered in conjunction altogether. And last but not least, uh, we would like in Digital for Planet to widen the, the discussion a little bit to include not only, let's say, the technologically centered uh, institutions and innovators that we also ourselves are more familiar with, but to reach out towards uh, the, those, those uh, line of thought that starts from the, the economic uh, rethinking of the mainstream economic models and even the environmental activism that, like, uh, let's say, IT starts to now grasp with the green aspect, also traditional uh, activism in, in environmental topics starts now to co more with the real impact of technology. And this is all. Uh, if you want to know more about us, uh, you can reach us on, 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 on our website. We have Twitter. And uh, please uh, ask questions also later or now in the chat. Thank you, Monique. I'm finished. Um, thanks a lot, Giovanni. Uh, Loretta, I don't know if you're still there. I would like to ask you to connect your video because then I would like to start animating a uh, connect uh, a little bit of a discussion about some of the points that you touched. So one of the things is um, that Loretta mentioned in, his, in her presentation is that we need very much to, um, to stimulate awareness. And I think this is very much true. And I'm, I'm glad to have seen that both at the level of Green Web and, and uh, Digital for Planet, there are several activities that go into the, to this direction. Now, within DigiConnect, Loretta, and within, you know, the more, uh, um, more specifically within the NGI, are there specific plans uh, for funding more uh, green technology or the greening of uh, internet technologies? So, oh. Um, yes, I've spent maybe eight years on engagement and also on sustainability, which means getting some more money for the next project, in most cases, even with startups. So I'd like to change from engagement to commitment, okay? Uh, it's a word that men don't like when they meet a young lady or whatever. I mean, commitment is something that I have seen at the level of project officers, uh, we had some meetings about two years ago, which were extremely radical. So I think on an individual level, you will find committed individuals all over the EU institutions. 
But I think it's up to you, up to the excellent organizations uh, that I've heard today. Uh, you are the ones that, uh, that, that make the link because the individuals are ready and committed, but sometimes reading, the more I read, the more I get depressed. Um, I read the, the Environmental Agency on the Circular Economy, and I was one of the first to have a DigiConnect session on the circular economy. Monique, you were there, you might remember. <laughs> it was a packed mm -hmm. room. But then I read that no matter how much we try, we only uh, get to 17% because these rare metals, uh, it costs so much to put a machine that, that's separate. So we are not going to make it uh, by you know, putting all our hopes into one basket. So I repeat, I think it's not just engagement, it's commitment, it's commitment to work with institutions. Uh, I think the idea of an hourly, uh, an hourly, you know, as was proposed, I think that's a good one. I, I hadn't heard of that before. What I know is that the green cloud, the clouds are getting, uh, are way ahead of the consumers, okay? Um, they've had, the industry has had time to think and they have many incentives now, uh, you know, to, to, to realize their ideas. Um, Thank you. But I would like to just finish with one of the words by my predecessor, which is complex uh, mindset. I think that's something we need to work on, on, on an individual basis. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you very much. Um, very inspiring as, as always. Um, Adrian, um, I would like to ask you a question in relation to um, the green uh, route uh, selection. So my question is uh, from a technical technological point of view, of course, to have uh, to optimize uh, the path selection according to some uh, greening or green criteria, you must have a way to um, assess uh, and quantify what do you mean by green. So here, uh, I think the hurdle is how the technology component that are used out there uh, allow you to actually identify how green they are. So uh, is uh, the work you have shown us based on simulations or you started to work with real uh, routers and machines that uh, allow you um, even at real time or almost at real time to identify this greenness? Yeah. A very good question. So, <clears throat> so far we worked with simulations, um, but the, the network is already in existence, right? That network I showed with hundred data centers, that, that is already there today. Um, so the idea is to add um, <clears throat> to these uh, beacon information. So the paths are being created you can attach anything you want to these paths. You can um, add additional information. And then if the sender wants to use that information, the sender can then select accordingly to which paths they, they prefer. So for instance, you could attach um, carbon um, CO2 information for traffic that flows through your network, what, um, how much additional CO2 will be produced per gigabyte, for instance. And then the sender can take that into account. Now the challenge is, why should you trust that? Right? So we're looking at a certification process, uh, working with the, there are several companies that do this and we could encourage them to then attach um, a certificate that states uh, perhaps every six or 12 months, um, this institution will go and visit to ensure they are reporting on the correct power mixes, but there's also a temporal component with respect to uh, solar energy, which changes a lot also as Chris was showing, um, or wind energy changes a lot, but a sign path is valid for five, six hours. And so in that time, you can predict what the solar um, exposure is going to be or the wind, you can also predict a certain extent. Um, then you can add this information uh, to, to the packets. And so the sender can then, having um, a choice amongst 20 different paths, can then optimize based on latency and CO2 and so on, or ethics today. In the earlier session today, somebody was mentioning ethical routing. You can also select where you want to go through, right? And you see which jurisdictions you traverse or your packets traverse, I should say. 
Um, here, I guess we're opening up a Pandora uh, vase in a way because there's a lot here to do uh, that must be addressed also at the level of uh, regulation, as you mentioned, at the level of also of standardization and at the level of uh, measuring uh, actually what kind of um, you know, greenness parameter will uh, be the one applied for the specific routing criteria, right? So uh, what you said, Adrian, uh, made me think also of a point that in fact, I wanted to ask Chris. Um, Chris, you mentioned that uh, you uh, maintain a catalog of green providers and um, operators. Um, my question here, what is the criteria to be defined a green provider? Uh, do you use um, metrics and measurements that are somehow recognized as standard? Did you define some? Can you share a little bit more about this? Uh, yeah, um, I'll share a link to the page that we call what you need to register, where we list this and have some helpful diagrams. But generally, the approach we use is uh, we look for evidence of an organization taking steps to basically account for or zero out the carbon emissions from the electricity that they use. And the reason we are taking that level is because it's if you say you need to be running on green power, there are certain parts of the world where because of the market structure is because uh, of the market structure, that's literally impossible. So in, say, states in America, they have something called a natural monopoly, which means they can only ever buy power from one company. And if that company is not you is not sourcing entirely from green power, then they have no other option. So, uh, so you need to account for this. And this is that exactly what Google and Microsoft and all the large companies do as well. They need a, they, they, they resort to a portfolio of different standards and different approaches that you have for this. Now, this is the approach we take because it's extremely messy. And if you were to look at the slightly wider scale, you'll see this kind of debate happening at a kind of finance level with the EU's own uh, green taxonomy, where they're trying to figure out what counts as a green investment. It's basically kind of a, a a kind of fractal complexity problem, which is why I actually think that talking about things in terms of CO carbon intensity and uh, CO2 emissions per hour is actually much, much more useful. And that's something that you can have more control over. And it's also something that's collected anyway at the EU level. So I think, because this is the data that's currently published by the EU. And if you're a regulator, you are collecting this every five minutes from every wind turbine any, every, anyway, because, you're, you, you, because this is the underlying data which is used to decide what kind of subsidies people get. But the people who are actually collecting this data for subsidies are not necessarily realizing that it could also be repurposed to essentially instrument a transition of the internet away from fossil fuels and to something much more advanced and humane like wind and solar and geothermal and everything else. And Chris, if you can share with us um, um, the link you mentioned at the beginning, yeah. that would be great. Um, this comes to uh, this allows me to come to another point that Federica Lucivero, uh, Lucivero from the audience uh, made with respect to Giovanni's intervention. So she says, thank you for all your presentation. They were great in particular in respect to Giovanni's reflections as an ethics ethicist and social scientist working on the sustainability of digital technology. I was very interested in learning how you plan uh, to include else aspects in practical ways. Also, one question that seemed relevant to me and to my colleague working in this area, blah, 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 is the question of, of who is responsible for what in this area um, I was wondering whether the panelists had any thought on this. Well, mm, that's that's a very good question. Giovanni, can you share with us your reflection on this? Yeah. I'll start with a disclaimer because here we have an engineer answering an ethical question from a philosopher or at least social scientist. So bear with me with my, let's say, rough understanding of the, of the subtleties. But let's say, um, Basically, it's like diversity. You know? can you be? Can you have a diversity policy if the steering committee is all uh, of a certain ethnicity and gender? Difficult. So, first step would be that we would like we would like in Digital for Planet to have different stakeholders together that come from different experiences. So, to include else, we need experts of the E, of the L, and of the S, not only experts of the technology. So that would be a, a, one first point. Just by having a more representative groups 
engaging in, in, in our work, then we should already have some, let's say at least some ideas of what matters and how to combine the technology, ethical and, and the socioeconomical aspects. And then uh, I think uh, from the point of view of the responsibility, and here I, I say my piece and then uh, the colleagues can, can add their own, of course. Uh, I think someone already put it in the chat that in Digital for Planet, we have this, uh, let's say a little uh, campaign and booklet and uh, tips uh, how to improve your digital uh, behavior or digi the, the footprint of your digital behavior as a single, as a user, which is of course uh, appreciated and we, we did it with, with the best intentions. But we are aware that like you don't solve the sea pollution by cleaning up the, the, the beaches, there is always uh, um, a balance of responsibility. So uh, when I learned more details about how much the devices impact on the consumption and how much the, the, the quick turnaround of, of things like uh, mobile phones also, also impacts the, 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 the environment, I was surprised. So I have to say that probably because we are less aware in this than we are in, in plastic uh, waste, for example, we can still do a lot as, as, as consumer, but is by no means sufficient. So there is the responsibility of the individual user, but there is also the responsibility of the big actors. So Google is trying in, in, in some areas and uh, uh, let's say in the area of large data centers and cloud versus edge computing, that's also another interesting problem of responsibility because we are in a situation like when someone discovers that the, the most environmentally sensitive way of rearing, of rearing uh, farm animals is uh, intensive chicken farms, which are the least, uh, let's say, the one that make us feel less good about our, our, our you know, enlightenment of, of, of dealing with, with animals. Likewise, at the moment, the best uh, uh, cloud environments are the largest data centers which in Europe we don't really have, or rather they are owned by the hyperscalers. So also here, I would say that like in many cases, the responsibilities must come from a joint action, both on the, let's say, demand side. So like we have seen, we could start uh, this virtuous cycle where people get aware of the environmental impact and then the force the ISP to, to, to follow suit and so on. But then of course, uh, like in all these multi-actor social, uh, social uh, progress, um, uh, let's say processes, we have also the regulation part, right? So this uh, I, I don't want to enter into, but it's clear that the direction set by the European Commission and the national governments also makes, makes a big difference, whether it is research, whether it is tax policies, where it, whether it is uh, incentives for specific, uh, for specific uh, energy sources. Hope this answered the question. Thank you, Giovanni. I think it's a very comprehensive uh, answer, uh, and it's it's tricky to also find all the pieces that come together to give uh, you know um, an exhaustive view on this because probably it's one of those uh, uh, never-ending answers that would need to be uh, put together. Now, um, with respect to um, Yes, uh, Federica is very happy about your answer. So um, please, I'm asking the audience in case you have further questions because we're coming to the, to the end of our um, uh, webinar. Um, what I would also uh, kindly ask my speakers is to provide one sentence, uh, one call to action uh, for the audience, for the NGI community. We have here um, a subset of the uh, people that uh, join us uh, in, this morning at the NGI forum. And uh, we have researchers, we have scientists, we have SMEs, we have uh, policy makers. And I think it's very important here to give a sense of uh, where will uh, each of us with different profiles and, and uh, um, capabilities go and help making the difference. So here, Loretta, uh, from uh, you know, the, the commission, from policymakers' point of view, what is your uh, call to action? It's easy. Practice what we preach or what you preach. It's easy to say and hard to do, but I see the next generation being more vegan, uh, doing data minimization. I think they're a lot better than uh, the 50 years of plastic and ruining of, uh, that we've seen in the previous generation. So yes, pra let's practice what we preach. Thank you, Loretta. Adrian. 
Yeah, um, I would say it'd be good to have carbon transparency for whatever you do on the internet, um, for web pages as the Green Web Foundation is doing, but also for communication traffic or if we use data centers, be great if we could optimize uh, based on carbon being produced and uh, trade off latency with, um, uh, with uh, the amount of carbon produced so that you could select the data center that's much further away potentially, um, but uses a lot less cooling, for instance, a powerful cooling. So more transparency. Yes, I think is uh, what I would say. Yeah, I think it would be great uh, that we can empower users by providing them uh, reliable information about, uh, you know, uh, choices and options they have in right. their digital habits and digital behavior. Uh, I totally agree with you. And I also totally agree with, with the point made by Loretta. Uh, you know, just to, to promote and speak and, and you know, uh, advertise is not enough. We really have to put in practice what, what we preach. And I, I noticed that Loretta goes uh, off with her video every time she doesn't speak, which is a great uh, digital habit for saving energy and data. Um, so I, I don't do that today because I'm moderating the event, but uh, we try also to do that in other uh, context. So now, Chris, what is your call to action to the community? Um, I'd say, um, think systemically, green your stack and make sure green power is 24 seven fossil free power. That's all. Can you repeat? Green, green your, your stack. Yes. Make sure green power is fossil free power 24 seven. Okay. Great. This is, um, this is, I like this. Uh, sorry, I always take notes. Uh, I'm very old fashioned. I know that we, we might look again at this, but um, um, greening your stack, it's uh, something that, as I mentioned before, in my view, goes from very low technical and technological choices up to choosing uh, service providers, choosing the right applications, but also changing our mindset. And this is uh, going back to what basically each of the speakers have said. Now, Giovanni, what is your call for today to, to conclude this uh, webinar? Well, I would really repeat the first one of Chris and one from Loretta. So think systemically and, um, and uh, have a complexity mindset. So these problems are tricky because we cannot uh, choose our favorite button and push it a lot. We have to act on, on, many, on many different levels. And uh, if I can, let's say, praise a, a new uh, let's say expression that, that I've seen uh, in, in the, by the commission recently is this multi-actor approach. Horizon Europe, there is this multi-actor approach. It's a new name, but it, it, it's another reiteration of this important thing. So no single category can solve or even address this problem uh, on their own. So it's really um, together, but also together in diversity, okay? If together means me and all the people like me, then it's not gonna really work. So I would say think systemically and uh, band up with people that are not always exactly like you, but try to, 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 to have a good randomized kind of uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, task force, so to speak. Thank you very much, Giovanni, and thank you to Roland. Roland is somebody from the audience that say, yes, let's practice what we preach. So let's change from Zoom to a decent video conference, conferencing provider. And he makes an example that is green also in Europe and based on open source um, software. Uh, yes, we investigated several alternatives. Also within the NGI community, we have a few uh, tools uh, that are being developed. So we're waiting um, for some of them to be a little bit more stable. We did several trials and tests, uh, but definitely this is the way to go. And thank you, Ro Roland. I see you now on screen. Thank you. Hi. And uh, uh, the links and resources and, and pointers that you have shared with us, we will collect and uh, publish in a short report of this um, workshop. So uh, we will make available the presentations we've got. And of course, this is far from being uh, the end of this discussion because uh, 
these topics need to be further elaborated at several levels by uh, different uh, by the different stakeholders involved in the internet value chain creation. Uh, that is a very complex one, uh, very articulated, and of course, it's, it has a lot of political implications. But what was good today is to hear from Loretta that there is a growing awareness and also commitment, to use her words, also at the European Commission level to pursue and, and make it happen. And at the same time, Loretta reminded about the importance that organizations like ours do not wait for the big to move. Uh, we have all to move, we have all these responsibilities. So associations like the Green Web and Digital for Planet are probably the best uh, uh, catalyzer, let's say, are, are examples of uh, non-profit associations where we might find a lot of room to grow this um, next generation sustainable internet. So with these words, I would like to thank all of you, all of the people in the audience that have participated, and I hope to see you in person, all of you very soon. Take care. Bye.